Well, that was bad. <clears throat> Today is Sunday, August the 29th, 2021. I picked, randomly, kind of, three headlines out of the news this last week or so. I'm going to explain the headlines via the Bible. Now, I'm going to read all of Matthew 24 in a little bit, so for those of you that take a little time to find it, you might want to turn to Matthew chapter 24, for whatever version of the Bible you have. I'm going to use a New Living Edition, but um, you just might want to be ready. <clears throat> Matthew 24 is really the heart and soul of the message. Have you ever wondered why so many people seem confused today about what they should do, what they should do in church, in life, in their families? with their health. You only need to understand one simple thing to explain most. Actually, you need to ask yourself a question. I'm not looking for a response. You don't raise your hand. You don't just ask yourself and be honest with yourself. What is the Great Commission? I know you've heard it. But what is it? Do you know what the Great Commission is? Can you articulate it so that others can understand what it is? Do you follow the Great Commission? Who gave us this commission? Your church? Your denomination? The government? If you can in all honesty say yes, you know what it is, and you believe you are following it, you rank in the top 17% of all professing Christians. That's just how many a Barna survey come up that said that they could answer all those questions, explain it to others. In the other response, you're in the 83% of the remaining Christians. I spent a good amount of my life in the 83%. There's nothing wrong with the 83% as long as you understand that you're not in the top 17%. doesn't make you left saved, but it does make life a little scarier. Actually, if you attend St. John's and have for very long, you really don't have any excuse because I've given several messages on the Great Commission. There's more coming in the future. I'll say the same thing and twist it a different way because it's important. It's one of the only real commissions we have, one of the only real orders we have from Jesus Christ. But here it is again to refresh your memories. Matthew 28, 16 through 20. This is the New Living Translation. Then the eleven disciples left for Galilee, going to the mountain where Jesus had told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him. That was good. But some of them doubted. Now here we've got some of the disciples worshiping Jesus, but doubting. Jesus came and told his disciples, I have been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Not some authority. Not a little authority. I've been given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go. Didn't say therefore stay. Therefore set. Therefore, wait for people to come to your door. Didn't say any of that. Said, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them. Didn't talk about dunking them, sprinkling them, pouring. Said, baptizing them. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I've given you. And be sure of this. I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Now that's our great commission. It's pretty simple. We're told to go. We're told where to go. And we're told what to do when we go there. It would seem a simple enough directive to follow. But yet only 17% of professing Christians 
seem to know that. I think knowing, understanding, and following the Great Commission would help you understand a lot of what's going on in the world. Today's message is a little bit different than anything I've done in the past from the pulpit. I've never done this before. But I've taken three headlines, and I'm going to match them with three scripture headlines. Headline number one from Main Street Media. This is a statement by a Marine captain. I served in Afghanistan as a U.S. Marine twice. Here's the truth in two sentences. Now, these are his words. These are the Marine captain's words. Here's the truth in two sentences. What we are seeing in Afghanistan right now shouldn't shock you. It only seems that way because our institutions are steeped in systematic dishonesty. It doesn't require a dissertation to explain what you're seeing. Just two sentences. Sentence number one. For 20 years, politicians, elites, and D.C. military leaders have lied to us about Afghanistan. Second sentence. What happened last week was inevitable, and anyone saying differently is still lying to you. I know. I was there on special operations twice as part of the task force. I learned to speak Pashto. That's the native tongue most of them speak. As a U.S. Marine captain, and I spoke to everyone I could every day. I talked to the people, the elites, the allies, and yes, even the Taliban. The truth is that the Afghan National Security Force was a jobs program for Afghans, propped up by U.S. taxpayer dollars, a military jobs program, populated by non-military people or paper forces that didn't even exist and a bevy of elites grabbing what they could when they could. Well, that kind of explains the fast and complete failure of the Afghan army. This army that we were told we were leaving all this equipment to doesn't exist. It goes straight to the Islamists and the Taliban. That's headline one. Headline two, there's a report that the Taliban are killing people found with Bibles on their phones. The Taliban seized leadership of the country last Sunday after surrounding the uh, nation's capital, Kabul, prompting former uh, President Ashre Jhanti to flee. The Taliban ruled Afghanistan until 2001 when the United States invaded and took over lost many, many good Americans since then. The Taliban had a brutal regime. They regularly persecuted political dissidents, religious minorities, women, and anyone they considered to be violating Islamic law or Sharia. According to SAT-7, it's an organization that broadcasts Christian programs to churches and Christians in the Middle East and North Africa, the Taliban is using spies and informats to prosecute the Christian uh, minority in the country. We're hearing from reliable sources that the Taliban demand people's phones, and if they find a downloaded Bible on your device, they will kill you immediately, said SAT-7. Um, this was said by SAT-7 North America President, Dr. Rex Rogers. It's incredibly dangerous right now for Af Afghans to have anything Christian on their phones Taliban have spies and informants everywhere. We're going to hear much more about this a little bit later, but for now, let's read Matthew 24, 9 through 10. Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You'll be hated all over the world because you are my followers, and many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. That's what's happening. People are being betrayed, spied upon hated because they're followers of Christ. Main media, Main Street Media, headline number three. Media is busy at work cleaning up the Afghanistan failure. CNN's John Avalon, I found the quote, I didn't watch him, I don't watch CNN, but I found 
the quote of what he said. Uh, John Avalon on Tuesday summoned his best angerman's voice to stress to his viewers that more important than the ongoing calamity in Afghanistan, where the democratic government we tried to install has collapsed, that this issue has become a partisan uh, political points by Republicans. They're scoring points at the expense of President Joe Biden, Avalon said. Republicans were attempting to whitewash history by, get this, by observing the overrun airport in Cabal and the thousands of Afghans desperately attempting to flee. So to this CNN reporter, the real problem is that people noticed, including some of the Republican leadership. I mean, how dare they notice? How dare they look at the people dying? A suicide bomb attack Tuesday, uh, Thursday outside of Abbey Gate at Cabal's airport killed 13 U.S. service members and injured at least 18 more, making it the deadliest day for U.S. troops in years. Officials told Fox News late Thursday that those killed included 10 Marines, two Army soldiers, and Navy corpsmen. The suicide bomb attack was followed by a firefight by the Islamic State uh, gunmen at the gate, where the night before there had been 5,000 Afghans and likely some Americans seeking access to the airport to flee. Crowds had gathered for days seeking to escape the country, and there had been multiple warnings about that th terror threat. Friends, I believe these are all precursors to the full attack by Satan and his demons. Because we read in Bible headline number one. This is Matthew 24. I'm going to start at the first verse. Jesus speaks about the future. As Jesus was leaving the temple grounds, his disciples pointed out to him the various temple buildings. But he responded, do you see all these buildings? I tell you the truth, they will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. Later, Jesus said on the Mount of Olives, his disciples came to him privately and said, tell us when all this will happen. What sign will signal your return and the end of the world? Jesus told them, don't let anyone mislead you. For many will come in my name claiming, I am the Messiah. They will deceive many. And you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these things must take place, but the end won't follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. But all this is only the first of the birth pains, with more to come. Then you will be arrested, persecuted, and killed. You will be hated over all the world because you are my followers. And many will turn away from me and betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Sin will be rampant everywhere, and the love of many will grow cold. Friends, we're seeing that unfold. We're seeing it unfold in America, all the other nations of the world. Verse 13. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world, so that all nations will hear it, and, come, and the uh, end will come. Back to the Great Commission. Our commission is to go into all the world. Preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. Tell the good news. Baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And teach the new disciples everything that we've been taught. We're told that again here in Matthew. That the whole world will hear the message of Jesus Christ before the end. Verse 15, I'm going to give you this in two different versions. The day is coming when you will see what Daniel the prophet spoke about, the sacrilegious object that causes desecration standing in the holy place. Reader, pay attention. Here's the same verse in the um, New King James. You're probably more likely used to that. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel and the prophet standing in the holy place, whoever reads this, let him understand. Verse 16. Then those in Judea must flee to the hills. 
A person out on the deck of a roof must not go down into the house to pack. A person out in the field must not return even to get a coat. How terrible it will be for pregnant women and for those for nursing mothers in those days. And pray that your flight will not be in the winter or on the Sabbath. For there will be greater anguish than any other time since the world began, and it will never be so great again. In fact, unless that time of calamity is shortened, not a single person will survive. But it will be shortened for the sake of God's chosen ones. Here he's talking about this calamity. But it's focused on Judea. It's focused on Israel. It's focused on the Middle East. I've looked the Bible through cover to cover, read everything I can get my hands on, and there's not one credible mention of America. There are some things that could be America, that point to America, that people interpret as America, but there is no definitive America like you have Israel, like you have Galilee, like you have Jerusalem, like you have Babylon. No specified place called America mentioned in tribulation. Verse 23. Then if anyone tells you, look, here is the Messiah, or there he is, don't believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will rise up and perform great signs and wonders so as to deceive, if possible, even God's chosen ones. People get kind of caught up on that one. They believe that you can be deceived. If you are a saved, Bible-believing Christian, you are not in danger of being deceived. Oh, they'll have many wonderful things. You'll look at them. You might even think, is it possible? But you have Jesus' warning. Because he says, as if to deceive, if possible. Well, that is an impossibility. See, I've warned you about this ahead of time. Verse 26. So if someone tells you, look, the Messiah is out in the desert, don't bother to go. Don't bother to go and look. Or look, he's hiding here, don't believe it. For as the lightning flashes in the east and shines to the west, so it will be when the Son of Man comes. Just as the gathering of the vulture shows there is a carcass nearby, so these signs indicate that the end is near. Immediately after the anguish of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will give no light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. And then at last, and then at last, the sign that the Son of Man is coming will appear in the heavens, and there will be a deep mourning among all the people of the earth, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with mighty blasts of a trumpet. And they will gather his chosen ones from all over the world. From the furthest ends of the earth and heaven. Now learn a lesson from the fig tree. When its branches bud and its leaves begin to sprout, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see all these things, you can know that his return is very near. Right at the door. Friends, we're seeing these very things. The return is right at the door. I tell you the truth, this generation will not pass from the scene until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. However, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in, the days, uh, in Noah's day. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up to the time Noah entered his boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the floods came and swept them all away. That is the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. Two men will be working together in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. So you too must keep watch, for you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Understand this. If the homeowner knew exactly when a burglar was coming, he would have kept watch and not permitted his house to be broken into. You must also be ready all the time for the Son of Man will come when least expected. A faithful servant is one uh, to whom the master can give the responsibility of managing his other household servants and feeding them. 
If the master returns and finds the servant has done a good job, there will be a reward. I tell you the truth. The master will put that servant in charge of all he owns. But what if the servant is evil and thinks my master won't be back for a while and he begins beating the other servants, partying and getting drunk? The master returns unannounced and unexpected and he will be cut and he will cut the servant to pieces, assign him to a place with the hypocrites. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That is a description of what is going on today. That is a description of what we see happening. We're told that the angels, when Christ returns, will gather up people from all over the world. But then they go on to say, and heaven. I found that to be interesting. When this was written 2,000 years ago, roughly, nobody dreamed of any human being being up in heaven. That was a realm for the angels. That was a realm for not humans. Humans were totally earthbound. So why did Jesus said when he comes back, the angel will gather up all the faithful in the earth and the heavens? We have permanent people in space right now. We have permanent people among the space station. If God delays, it won't be too much longer till we have permanent people on the moon. And I don't think it'll be all that long before we have permanent people on Mars. Probably 30 years, 40 years, but a short time. God's going to gather up the faithful, the saved, wherever they're at. The message by Jesus tells us several things. We do not know the date and the time, but we are allowed to. We're given the season. When you look around, the season should be clear. Bible headline number two is a little shorter. This is in Revelation 13, 7 through 10. And this kind of explains what's going on right now with the war against Christians. And the beast was allowed to wage war against God's holy people and to conquer them. And he was given authority to rule over every tribe every, um, and people and language and nation. This would be that one world order they keep talking about. It's a big movement. They're trying to go to it. They're trying to do without borders. They're trying to make it one world financial, one world religious, one world everything. And it's going to happen. This will happen. He was given authority to rule over every tribe and people and language and nation. Hmm. Verse 8. And all the people who belong to this world worship the beast. They are the ones whose names were not, were not written in the book of life that belongs to the Lamb who was slaughtered before the world was made. If you are saved, your name was written in the Lamb's book of life before Adam took his first breath. So amazing to see how God has got this. People worry about their salvation. Am I saved? Can I lose it? Can I do that? Your name was written in the Lamb's Book of Life before the foundation of this earth was laid. If that don't give you peace and security, I don't know what will. Terrible times are coming. I don't know about for America, but I'm sure we'll get our share. But for Christians around the world, we see it happening today. We prayed earlier for the ones that are being slaughtered. Christians, military, all kinds of people being slaughtered. Verse 9, anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Anyone who is destined for prison will be taken to prison. If you're destined for prison, you're going to go to prison. Anyone destined to die by the sword will die by the sword. If you're destined to be martyred, you will die a martyr's death. We're not doing nothing but changing addresses, people. We don't die. We just change where we live. We're told all this to understand and to know about what's going to descend upon the earth. Satan knows that he has a short time and an uncountable number of Christians will die. 
But there's more to the story. My third headline from the Bible, Revelation 7, 9 through 14. After this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language, standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands. And they were shouting with a great roar, Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. And all the angels were standing around the throne and all around the uh, elders and the four living beings. And they fell before the throne with their faces to the ground and worshiped God. They sang, Amen, blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and strength belong to our God forever and ever. It's an endless praise for eternity. Then out of the 24 elders, then one of the 24 elders asked me, who are these who are clothed in white? Where did they come from? And I, John being the author of this, and I said to him, sir, you're the one who knows. Then he said to me, listen to this. These are the ones who died in the great tribulation, and they have washed their robes in the blood of the lamb and made them white. An uncountable number of Christians will die for Jesus Christ. And it's happening today. We're not seeing it too much in our nation. But we're told it comes from every nation, every land, every people, every language. So we know that it will happen here as well. Bible headline number three. This is the shortest one. 2 Thessalonians 2.8. I love this. I just, I love this. This is great. Then the man of lawlessness will be revealed. We'll know who he is. But the Lord Jesus will slay him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. That's what it's going to take to eradicate Satan and the demons from this earth. The simple breath from Jesus' mouth and the splendor of his coming will defeat Satan. This is the end of Satan. It's the end of evil, greed. Christ reigns forever. And we, as his servants, as his children, as his brothers and sisters, we live forever too. I don't know what you're facing on this earth. Some of you are facing horrible trials, tribulations. Could be health, could be mental, could be money, could be whatever affects a human being is affecting most of us at one point or another. But I can tell you right now, Jesus Christ has it covered. If you know Jesus, your name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. When that book is open, your name will be seen your name will be read. I don't know how anything on this earth could possibly get us down when we know that to be the absolute truth. I hope today I was able to bring a little peace but a little reality to what's happening. We pray for the Christians in other countries. We pray for the Christians here but we also know that many are going to be slaughtered no matter how we pray, no matter how often we pray. Maybe some of us. We know that Satan will appear to be winning. We know that many will be deceived. If possible, even the elect, but it's not possible. For Jesus goes on to say, I have told you this beforehand. You know what's coming. You know what to look for hurts my heart every time I see one of these stories and hear of these massacres. But I also know that it's part of God's plan and that the saved are going home. Ask earlier how many wanted to go to heaven and most everybody raised their hand. I didn't have so many hands when I asked if you want to go right now. You know, we tend to hang on to life or want to. I think that's also from God. I think without that self-preservation, that desire to live, that desire to keep going, most of us would surrender to death 
fairly quickly and fairly easily? I think we would. I think God built this defense in us that we will stay alive until he decides it's time. Told you it'd be a little different message. I hope it made sense. I've worked on it this week. There's about a zillion other things that could be said, but probably don't want to sit here for three or four days. Let's go to the Lord. Dear Heavenly Father, I pray that you bless the words that have been spoken, the scriptures that have been read, the hearts that have received. I pray, Father, that anyone that's watching this on video that does not know your Son, Jesus Christ, as their Savior, will immediately confess their sins, repent, and turn to Christ for salvation. I pray that the ones that are in danger turn to you immediately, Father. Father, I pray that you return soon, that Jesus Christ gathers up his own, that the tribulation come and go, and that Satan be defeated. Father, I pray all that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.